All right, everybody, I think we're going to get going. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I think so, but just in case. Okay. Um, I'm Johanna Sullivan. Uh, for those of you I haven't met or don't know, I'm the director of the Office of Public Safety at DCJS. Uh, so the Give Initiative and Snug and CAC is all outside of our office or included within our office. And I'm really happy uh, to have you guys here today to hear about the red flag uh, law and hear a little bit about how that's going to work. Um, as everyone knows, uh, the issue of gun control is appropriately, obviously, at the forefront of many conversations these days. Some states have adopted the extreme risk protection laws, which allow those in law enforcement, concerned family members, and school administrators to appeal to the courts for in order to remove the guns uh, from those that are in danger either of hurting themselves or hurting others. In August of this year, New York adopted such a, a law, and um, like many pieces of new legislation, when they first come out, not everybody understands it. It can be a little bit confusing. People don't necessarily understand how it's going to work, how it's going to implement, be implemented, and how it might affect uh, law enforcement, per se. But fortunately, we have two people here today who are experts on it and can talk to us about that. Um, to my right is Michael Sean Spence, who started his career in law enforcement at the Queens County DA's office. And we at DCJS were very fortunate that he joined us. Uh, he, we pulled from his experience at the DA's office to help with a lot of the GIVE initiatives and a number of other initiatives. While we were fortunate to have him, he was unfortunate that he had to spend three years driving around the state with me uh, as we implemented those, those policies uh, and worked to do that. Um, he currently now is the Director of Policy and Implementation at Every Town for, for Gun Safety. And with him is Jackie Pitts, who is joined, who is the Council for Policy and Implementation uh, at Every Town also. And I'm going to turn it over to them because they're the ones who know what this is all about and hopefully will help all of us. So thank you. Good morning. All right. Um, thank you for that introduction, jo Johanna. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Michael Spence. I'm now the Director of Policy Implementation at Every Town for Gun Safety. Before we begin um, discussing the new law, which went into effect on August 24th, as pretty much everyone in here should be aware and probably is, um, I want to thank each and every one of you for the work you do. Um, as a former prosecutor in New York City, and as Johanna mentioned, then a special assistant at DCJS, I'm well aware of the constant risk uh, posed to law enforcement officers when you do your jobs day in and day out. Furthermore, even without ERPO, um, I know that each and every one in this room does everything they can to safeguard life, to remove firearms from those who are prohibited, and prevent those who pose a risk to themselves or others from actually effectuating that harm. And I thank you for that effort. The whole point of ERPO, and um, we're going to get a bit into the weeds as to the work we did prior to passage um, in crafting the law, and then on the back end, working with a number of agencies to implement that law, as well as research our organization has done across the nation with other agencies. Um, I, I definitely want to point out that this is just meant to be another tool in your toolbox. Um, all of you are already removing firearms. Um, from prohibited people working with the courts, working across your counties. Much of the, the tips that we will share with you have been gleaned from folks just like you. So if you hear something familiar, that's a good thing. Um, and I'd like to also make sure that we give an opportunity for Jackie to talk a little bit more about her experience. Uh, at Every Town, we're a part of a very nimble team. Um, please join me, Jackie. Um, we're a part of a nimble team that works to implement evidence-based strategies across this nation. I like to say we focus on non-legislative strategies, these being the strategies you don't need to pass a law to do. Um, I include implementation in that um, because that comes after laws have been passed, okay? But we also talk about those other strategies that we implement in concert with local gun violence prevention groups. We work with mayors, governors, attorney generals, council people, as well as those local groups, communities, and survivors to make sure that they are locally informing all the strategies we work to advance. And Jackie has some really creative work that she also leads. Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie Pitt. I'm counsel in the policy and implementation team. Uh, a little bit of quick background. Um, I got my law degree in Australia. If you're noticing the accent originally, I was a federal litigator, clerked for a federal judge, um, and then really specialized in uh, domestic violence and now also removal of firearms and extreme risk protection order laws. Um, as you're all well aware, there's a lot of overlap between these laws, not only the people involved in many of these cases, uh, but particularly the mechanism, the, um, the temporary and final stage, the immediacy of the risk. Um, 
So it's a real pleasure to be able to bring that experience in domestic violence into this field in particular. Uh, a little forecast of what we'll speak with you today about. Um, we'll do a quick background about New York State's extreme risk protection order law. We're assuming that everyone here is familiar with the basics of the law. We want to dive into more of the details and best practices we see in other states. We'll also provide some lessons from research that has dived into how states have implemented these laws in the period in which they've been in effect. We'll also dive into some lessons from leaders in law enforcement across the nation. We'll also talk to you about working with unique stakeholders. New York's law differs from every other uh, state extreme risk protection order law in the country in that school administrators can also petition. We're going to talk about that. And we'll provide some tips for implementation towards the end. So a quick background. I think everyone here is across the purpose of an extreme risk protection order law. The idea is to provide you, law enforcement, and the community with a tool to safely, temporarily, and lawfully restrict a person's access to firearms when they pose a significant risk to themselves or to others. Now, uh, under New York law, of course, there are uh, specific petitioners laid out here. And we work as well in the drafting of these laws, in particular our state legislative team. And one of the most difficult practical as well as political questions in every case is who should be able to petition, who should be able to go directly to the courts, and who must go through law enforcement. In New York, the decision was that that would be law enforcement officers who can go straight to the court, district attorneys, school administrators at the person's school, or a designee provided by this uh, school administrator, or a person's family or household member. Uh, we've noted here a little note about the drafting and passage of this law. Uh, and I think originally um, there was a lot of political will and a lot of interest in uh, any member of a school community being able to petition. I think for a lot of people, they think ERPOs and they think schools and school shootings. Uh, our advice there is always that you know, petitioners, we shouldn't open the, the uh, courts to a floodgate of every single person that might wish to file a petition. We wanted to uh, put the locus of um, ability to petition within that school environment purely as school administrators. So there's a hierarchy and a decision-making process before paperwork is filed. Um, now, of course, as you're aware, it's a two-stage process. Under a temporary order, uh, and you file a petition with a court, you would need to prove probable cause that the, uh, the person is likely to engage in conduct causing serious harm to themselves or others. And for the final stage, it's clear and convincing evidence that's required. In a nutshell, right, after you've uh, observed a person or you've learned of an individual who poses a risk to themselves or others, um, and you've completed a petition, you've appeared before a court, an ex parte order will be issued for a temporary period of time. That individual will be afforded due process. They'll be able to return before the court, that being the respondent, to show proof of either um, not needing that order, right, or compliance with that order. Um, and then they will then determine whether that order will become final, okay? During the pendency of that case, law enforcement should remain in contact with the respondent's family. She should remain aware of any changes in circumstance, any need for escalation of response, perhaps even enhancement of the case. Um, as was also noted, there are different standards of burden at each of those levels. It raises at the final stage. Additionally, you can acquire a search warrant in tandem with an ERPO, but the same uh, requirements from Section 609 of the CPL are still uh, required. So let's talk a little bit about the research, and there's been a lot of research in this space going way back to the first ERPO, which was actually passed in Connecticut back in the 90s, the late 90s. Um, for those who are familiar with the research, Professor Swanson at Duke did an analysis. I'm looking at you, Professor Coper. Um, Professor Swanson did uh, that analysis of Connecticut as well as Indiana. Additionally, UC Davis has done more recent um, academic analysis on a number of states, including California, and we at Everytown have pulled uh, case-level data from a number of states, 10 in fact, and we've done an analysis as well. So we'll share a little bit about um, what we're finding. So here we list some of those states, California, Connecticut, Delaware amongst them, Florida, Maryland, which we consider to be a leader, and another state that has unique petitioners. They allow medical professionals there. Um, another state with unique petitioners, and as was mentioned earlier, we'll talk a little bit about how you engage them. Um, but another state that will have petitioners is Hawaii. Hawaii will actually have mental health, 
medical professionals as well as school administrators. They go into effect next year. DC is another current ERPO that has unique petitioners. They allow mental health only. So medical professionals in Maryland, mental health in DC. Now, they don't have the same rights here in New York, but it is informative as to how to deal with them and some of the unique issues that unique petitioners face. So we'll talk about that in a bit. But what we've seen since January 2018 to 2019, um, 3,900 ERPO petitions, okay? During that time, we went from about 15 states in D.C. to now about 17 states in D.C. that have ERPO. So that's not reflective of the entire country. Well, we found that the vast majority were filed in Florida as well as in Maryland. Um, additionally, there's widespread utilization. In states with ERPO laws, about 72% of the counties have filed them. What we have also found, though, is that ERPOs have been concentrated primarily in a handful of counties, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Doing a deeper dive into the cases in Maryland, and I should also add, um, I had the opportunity to attend and participate in John Hopkins ERPO Summit in May, where we convened a number of law enforcement agencies from around the nation, where we learned much of this data as well. Uh, Maryland was present. Maryland, of their 568 cases, they had 285 granted. 161 were denied. And that was not because the pose, person did not pose a risk to themselves or others, but the judge themselves, going through due process, determined that it was not the correct action of the court to issue that ERPO. That, need, that does not mean there aren't other alternatives, and that's why I started the way I did, because you have identified individuals like this in the past, and you've worked to remove their firearms and use other judicial means. All this means is that an ERPO was found by the judge to not be appropriate. 115 were di dismissed for failure to appear. This means the petitioner did not appear. The respondent need not appear for it to be issued at the ex parte phase. Petitioner must appear to move the case forward. If they don't, the judge will vacate or dismiss. Five were appealed. Individuals said, I have a change in circumstance. It was issued. You should, re you should uh, rescind it. You should reconsider my status. You should then change your decision. And two were simply rescinded by the courts. And what we've also learned across the nation is that frequently those circumstances do change. Individuals do take the next step. They do access mental health. Um, assistance. They do return to the court and they're able to prove that they're no longer posing a risk to themselves or others, at which time judges have, um, in our experience, then rescinded previously issued uh, ERPOs. Okay, so there were two particular issues that we wanted to dive into with the research. Um, the first was citizen utilization. And I think a, a real question for any people in the room will be, how often will I be required to file a petition like this? And by comparison, how often will people be comfortable going straight to the court by themselves? And what's the appropriate balance there? Um, not all states even permit citizens to file directly. Many require a petition to go via law enforcement. But here in New York, petitions uh, can be filed directly by individuals. So we, I guess, our expectation was that citizens might be reluctant to file themselves. They might wish to seek the help of law enforcement. Um, they might be uncomfortable with court proceedings. They might not feel they have the knowledge, expertise, et cetera. So it was relatively surprising to see that particularly in Maryland, one of the states with the most robust implementation, that citizens are willing to file ERPO petitions without assistance from law enforcement. In fact, in the petitions in uh, Maryland, almost half were filed directly by citizens. Uh, you know, a hypothesis there is that um, while it's early, there's not a lot of data and particularly not a lot of, a lot of survey data to really dig into this. A hypothesis is that for some people, there's an, uh, perhaps uh, a belief that they can avoid the uh, potential criminal consequences by finding them themselves. You know, ERPOs are a civil order, much like domestic violence. They might feel that by going straight to court and not involving law enforcement at the beginning of the case, that they really can... Um, take a protective step that they don't perceive as having such a strong intersection with the criminal justice system. Um, so we're very interested to see how that continues to play out and we're very interested to see what the data looks like in New York on that point in particular. We also think that in Maryland there's been much greater uh, education of citizens to enable them to do that and in other states where you see lower levels, perhaps fewer citizens are even aware that they have that ability. 
Our second interest was utilization over time. So is this something that people have been waiting for and they already know about? Or do people take a little time to get comfortable with the idea of filing these orders? Um, and particularly in the context of law enforcement, is there sufficient training straight off the bat? Or does it take a little time for good practices to seep through? So with the, there's not that many states with multiple years of reporting at this stage, but you know we dug into states that have had these orders for many years, California, Connecticut, Washington, and found that there is a very steady increase in petitions. I think the stat there is California. Um, you know, we saw petitions triple between 2016 and 2018. And again there, we expect that that's an increase in knowledge and increase in comfort and in good practices. And we'll talk a little bit more about community engagement when we get into some of our tips. But that was a great point, and that is likely why we have seen so many ERPOs concentrated in those two states, in Maryland and Florida, and California behind it, because they truly have invested in the training as well as the community engagement piece. So let's do a deeper dive and talk about what I was uh, preluding before regarding the concentration in specific counties. So looking at Maryland, and if you recall, more than 2,000 have already been uh, issued there. In Montgomery County, which adjoins Washington, D.C., for those who aren't familiar, where there are more than one million people, only 38 ERPOs have been filed. Yet in Anne Arundel County, with a population of less than 600,000, they have 84, more than double, okay? What we've learned in this instance is that the population might not necessarily determine how busy you will be, but truly it does go back to the community engagement, the training, the outreach, and the ability to identify the individuals who pose that risk. And Anne Arundel County has done a great job of it. I would be remiss if I did not note that last year they also did lose an officer while serving in ERPO. So it's necessary that you train folks as, as, in, as as critical of an instance of serving an order or a search warrant is, it is similar to a domestic violence response. We know the risk that pose, that's posed to officers. You have to train them as if the same might occur, even when just handing off an ERPO, because the same risk is posed to that officer. Uh, 2,369 ERPOs issued between March 28 and July 29 in Florida. That's notable because in Florida, only law enforcement can petition. So not one family member or friend went before a court. In every instance, it was a police officer and it was a sheriff. And I'll point to Pinellas County, which we'll talk a little bit more in a bit, but they are truly the leaders in um, Florida. The Pinellas County Sheriff's Office from Jump told every local police department, if you want to do an ERPO, you come to us first. We want to make sure we're tracking and aware of every individual, every ERPO petition, every issuance, every service, so that we can track compliance, enhance, enforce, and make sure that we're all properly aligned. Of course, they bring locals to the table, they keep them engaged, but they've taken responsibility for it. And in a number of states, we've seen the most successful and highest levels of issuances in those areas where law enforcement has taken the lead, and that's what we recommend as well. As we mentioned earlier, um, Professor Swanson has done a deep dive into the ERPO data going back now 20 years. Um, and he's found that every suicide prevented by an ERPO for every 11 gun removals, which means they are saving lives. It's, it's a bigger picture than just removing that gun from that individual who poses harm to that one person or that one school. You're saving that individual's life and hopefully able to wrap that person in the services that can reintegrate them to put the guns down. Additionally, increased enforcement of the ERPO law was associated with a 14% reduction in firearm suicide as well. So it goes back to the same thing. In Indiana, additionally, a 7.5% reduction in firearm suicide. And every suicide was associated with 10 uh, gun removals. So they were even more effective in Indiana. Caveat. Indiana's numbers should be looked at with a grain of salt. They do have very lax gun laws, which is unique and different from New York State. They had a higher flow of guns, so their data and their data analysis might be different than what we might find in a state like New York, where we have a lower flow of guns and we have better gun laws. 
but it's very informative, and this affirms that ERPO is a useful tool to prevent suicide, which we know is the vast majority of the gun-related deaths in this nation, if not two-thirds. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons from leading states. I know we're running out of time, so we're going to try to move quick. Um, as we mentioned before, the first step is community engagement. Um, that's the first step. And here are a couple examples. San Diego City's attorney, before they began implementing their law, became, before it became effective, they began talking to gun rights groups. They started going over their process. They started sharing their paperwork. They wanted them to be comfortable with the due process that would be provided to firearm uh, possessors. They were very, very happy with the process, and because of their participation in the implementation process, it actually got out to more folks. In Pinellas County, like I mentioned before, they engaged the courts and the community. They developed their own paperwork. They defined they define the process, not only for themselves, but for all law enforcement across the county, so that everyone was moving in a uniform manner, but ultimately they were the, uh, the hub on the wheel, and they were able to track and, and, and monitor every respondent, every um, issuance, to make sure they were complied with. Seattle Police Department, they de developed a video for respondents. If you go on the Seattle PD website, you'll find a video of a detective going through the process of receiving a firearm, disassembling it, putting it into a box, walking it into the storage unit, showing how the firearm, which is personal property, will be maintained, and how it will ultimately be uh, returned if that ERPO is then concluded and there are no other criminal actions against that individual. They find that that also made compliance higher because respondents felt as if they were humans. I, honestly, it's important that we recognize this is a civil process. These are not defendants. These are not people who have been accused of a crime most of the time, although we will talk about some instances where you can utilize it when they have been. But the vast majority are civil proceedings, and it is important to humanize the process to make people more compliant. And we've also heard from other um, agencies by simply calling the respondent, they would then come in. Simply saying, hey, you haven't brought that gun in yet. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I have work. I haven't been able to get there, this, that, and the third. Well, would you like me to pull up to your job? Oh, and then they come in, and it's that quick. Um, in Suffolk County DA's office, I'm not sure if you guys are here. Um, we've been working very closely with them over the last couple months as they've been preparing to implement on August 24th, and we've connected them with many of our partners that you see listed here to help them uh, identify um, some of the necessary strategies. But even before that, they engaged with their local school board. They had a conversation with their school administrators. Of course, the Suffolk police uh, provided the necessary assistance as they are more than capable of handling this on their own as they have a great firearm relinquishment unit. But having those conversations were necessary prior to implementation. That makes sure everyone is on the same page. Everyone knows what's happening, what they need to do to be effective in implementation. Um, ultimately, law enforcement is reliant on community being engaged to proactively identify individuals. Because as I mentioned before, frequently they will not be defendants. They will not be criminal justice involved. They will not be in your offices or in your jail cells. These will be folks who are in schools, who are in their homes, who are talking and writing and, and reading things that cause them to pose a risk to themselves, and their family members are best suited to identify that behavior. So remaining uh, connected to the community will assist you in identifying those individuals before they harm themselves or anyone else. And of course, talking about the continued engagement, we have a couple examples as well. Yeah, sure. So obviously, engagement and implementation is an ongoing process. It's something you can do at the very beginning and then walk away from. Uh, so we've seen a number of states that have uh, rolled out really excellent public awareness campaigns at the beginning of the implementation of ERPOs, but also to um, re-up those as time goes on so people are still aware of their options. But I think an important question always is, when is information going to be uh, best received and when is it most useful? So what we really like to see out, um, out of Maryland which responding officers who are trained in this, who have all this information at their fingertips, informing family members of their options at the time that they respond to a violent threat or to suicide risk. Um, you know, and the feedback from those officers was, even if the family member isn't ready at that moment to request that an ERPO be filed, that's the time that they're thinking about it, that it's closest to the top of their mind, and that they will then go and file one in the future if, when they've taken some time to think about it. Um, but that's the time that they need the information, not necessarily when they're just riding the bus. 
We've also really appreciated seeing times when attorneys general have put out guidance to law enforcement, um, again, showing engagement at the highest levels of government about how implementation is best done. So the New Jersey Attorney General has done this, put out guidance about when law enforcement should consider taking over a petition. Perhaps you're aware of community members who are planning to file a petition themselves, go directly to court, but in your opinion, the public interest would be best served by law enforcement doing that, having the um, resources and the expertise of law enforcement in the courtroom. That kind of guidance is critical and also something that you as law enforcement can be making um, really informed decisions about day to day. And as I've been mentioning over and over again, interagency coordination and um, I'll, I'll just jump into the examples because King County is a great example. Um, back in 2015, uh, they had their first DV DVRO law passed. In 2016, they identified that over 2,600 DVROs had been issued. Only 2% of the respondents had actually complied and given in their firearms. The following year, they convened a working group led by a retired judge with the PD, the county prosecutor's office, as well as the city attorney's office, and they began going to those ex parte hearings that I talked about in the beginning. They began standing up. They began telling the judge, oh, but you didn't know this about him. Oh, you didn't know that about him. Eventually, the defense bar got mad and said, you, you really can't do that. Um, they then went through the necessary process and were affirmed that they could actually provide an amicus brief based on the criminal history information they were aware of for that respondent and allow that judge to have that critical information at those critical decision points. They've continued to do that. They then began monitoring each of those issuances to see whether or not they were complying, what sort of information was being returned by the PD to the judge as statutorily required, because they had to provide a receipt when the firearm was given into the police, and they were able to identify gaps. They then created a unified team that still exists today, and since then, they've now dedicated staff within the DA's office, the police department, and the court to constantly generate that critical criminal history information for judges at their decision points, to monitor every case, every issuance, to also enhance when there was no compliance or change in circumstances. By having that unified effort across a number of agencies throughout the county, it enabled them to not only do that, but to do it efficiently and to do it quickly in response to the dangers posed by these individuals. And I think that that's a critical lesson in what might be able to help each and every one of us in our different counties across New York State as we work to implement. Additionally, uh, I think a lot of the examples we've given so far have been the use of ERPOs as a single strategy. People that might not otherwise have been engaging with you or with your officers. But we really wanted to highlight the use of ERPOs as part of a multi-pronged violence pre prevention strategy. Um, not to be used only as a standalone tactic. And I think there are two really telling examples of this. Um, the first comes out of King County again in Washington. And there, the feedback we've had is that law enforcement officers are using ERPOs to bridge really dangerous gaps in cases. Before, uh, prior to arraignment, perhaps there's a protective order in place, but there's a real threat of um, access to guns and, and use of guns. Um, so a case example they provided to us was where a criminal defendant had been hospitalized after an arrest for threatening harm to his former employer. The criminal offendant, defendant had not been arraigned. Uh, and there was no protective order in place or an, no surrender order in place. So to bridge the gap, Seattle law enforcement filed an ERPO. Uh, again, a similar example out of San Diego in California. There we had a criminal defendant uh, arrested for assaulting his father, and in custody he threatened to shoot a police officer. Again, law enforcement officials petitioned for an ERPO, received that, uh, and obtained seven guns, including three AR-15s that they were able to recover in that critical gap before the trial had been able to continue. Another example uh, occurred following the Harvest Festival shooting, which happened two years ago last week in Las Vegas. Um, an individual also in San Diego who was at work at the time, watched the video of it, remarked to a coworker, um, I wish he hadn't killed himself. Had it been me, I would have gone out in a blaze of glory. And then he said, if I get fired, I'm coming back with a gun. The co-worker told the supervisor, supervisor told the police, they were able to get an ERPO, and he uh, voluntarily surrendered a semi-automatic rifle. So these are different instances in which an ERPO was another tool in the toolbox, not a necessary tool, but a useful tool to quickly dispossess an individual prior to the violence happening, prior to them actually committing a crime. And I think that that's another useful tool. Um, additionally, we get to the training and the resourcing. 
earlier this year, I was in Massachusetts. I was talking with a number of police officers, and it, it blew my mind that they were completely unaware of what, this was one officer, was completely unaware of what was in the law, what was required, and what family members were allowed to do, and their process as well. He was worried that he was going to have to field and assist families doing their own petitions, and he was unaware that he could do them himself. It is important that officers are aware of the tools in their toolbox, how they work, and how to access them, the benefits that they bring to them. Um, additionally, they should be provided the necessary resources. In Seattle, for instance, they don't go with the SWAT team in serious situations because using SWAT is defined as use of force, but they do engage with the SWAT team in Washington. I see a couple furrowed brows. But in Washington, they will engage with the SWAT team and they'll have one of the SWAT members join them. So they'll work in advance to properly resource the officers so when it's a high stake situation, they have the proper support and artillery resources. Additionally, it's as simple as the paperwork, right? Individuals who bring in a firearm, they need to be provided with a receipt. That receipt has to be served on the court. Until it's served on the court, that person is non-compliant. So simply generating that paperwork and tailoring it to your community so it reflects your needs and resources as well as the demographics in the case you have to translate it into the top six language in New York State. Make sure you do that in advance so that people can access this tool when they need it. Oh, this is just a very quick note. We really encourage you to think about what happens after hours when courts are typically closed in your jurisdiction. So um, in Maryland, courts are actually required to hear open petitions after hours, and they really attribute that as one of the reasons why they've had such high numbers of filings, including by civilians. Um, and the general protocol there and what they're doing in Montgomery County in particular is when sheriff's deputies are called to an incident after hours, again, they're advising people of their options straight away in that moment, and they are finding that people are filing petitions in that moment of need. So we encourage you to consider ways that you can respond after hours to petitions as well. Now, your first thought is probably I do that already, right? I do search warrants all the time. I do them when I need to. This is an ERPO. Okay, this is a civil proceeding. Okay, make sure you've engaged with the right judges and make sure that they're available. I know in a number of counties you call your judge sometimes and they make themselves available. Make sure you have the right judge available to consider these orders. Unique stakeholders, and it's Q&A time, but I guess you guys want us to keep going, so we will. Non-law enforcement. Um, Non-law enforcement, and I, and I kind of uh, mentioned school administrators, mental health, doctors, but also families, okay? Um, and they have shared with us, most recently at that summit I mentioned earlier, a couple key things that you should keep in mind when thinking about your school administrators. One, they play a very unique role in the respondent's life, and they don't want to alter that delicate balance of trust and transparency, okay? So they're very disinclined to actually step into the place of a law enforcement officer and actually petitions to, for ERPO, so they're more likely to call you first. Secondly, the time constraints of their job, like all of us, right? But their job is to either teach or to run a school or to be an administrator. That is valuable time that they would then lose standing before a court, waiting for a judge just to have an ERPO considered and possibly denied. And then others fear retaliation. Doctors have said, if this is an individual who really poses a risk to others and I have a personal connection to this individual, and I'm now standing in front of a court, I'm putting myself sort of in harm's way. And that is a really true fear, a real fear for them, as well as for all of you. And that's why it's better that they defer to law enforcement as you guys are prepared to deal with that, and they are not. But these are all three notes that, will, uh, that lead me to believe school administrators, although they are empowered, will still rely on all of you. And it's important that when you're engaged in your community, you include those folks like the Suffolk County DA did, talking to those school administrators, talking to your school boards, talking to those school associations, making sure they're advised of what the law allows, as well as the resources you're able to provide for them. Additionally, stay in contact with them. They have unique experience and knowledge. They can bolster your petition. So although you might take over that petition for them, they can give you critical information that can make your petition more successful. Additionally, they will likely may remain in contact with the respondent so they can inform you of any changes in circumstance that might inform your strategy moving forward. 
Yeah, and to echo that, I attended a conference of school administrators to specifically discuss ERPO earlier this year. And there was a big speech and a lot of um, excitement, I think, about the fact that they'd been given this opportunity and this right. Um, but then the question time began. And the first question was, could, can I be anonymous if I file a petition? And I think that that really goes to show that while there's a real um, need and desire from school officials to have a way to deal with these problems and these fears, going it alone is something they really are concerned about. So we want to talk also about the specific role of sheriffs and police departments. Um, really, it's the primary role in this legislation. It's the identification of individuals. It's engagement with the potential respondents, but also those who are, are fearing for their lives. Uh, management of service, se search and seizure of weapons, actually filing petitions. And a common issue we've had come up as we've spoken with other folks is the availability and issuance of search warrants. So search warrants don't just come as part and parcel of an ERPO, right? They have to be separately petitioned for. Um, in the same moment, usually the judge will hear both petitions at the same time, but it's crucial that you do that work at the same time, that you're thinking in advance about whether there is enough evidence for a simultaneous uh, issuance of both an ERPO and a search warrant. Um, so when we deal with other stakeholders, and particularly folks in Washington, their advice was a standard protocol for ERPO service. Um, one that builds in the um, knowledge of exactly when and where, sorry, exactly where weapons are stored, numbers, types, serial numbers where available, uh, common uses, where they might be hidden, et cetera. Um, a really detailed investigation pre-service. And I know that the New York State legislation actually requires background research to be done in the process once a, a, a temporary order has been issued. But secondly, they have this preference to attempt to serve the respondent outside the home and then accompany the respondent back to the home to prevent um, the risk of tragedy, the risk of um, real escalation with the respondent barricading themselves inside a home where they are armed. And prosecutors, uh, frequently when we have conversation with prosecutors about ERPO, they ask, and what's our role? This is civil, I don't do this. Um, but as we talked about earlier, there are instances where you may want to enhance your case. You may have an individual who poses a risk, maybe they're in custody, they talk about how they're gonna do harm to someone if they're released. You might have knowledge, and even if you don't have knowledge, they need not already possess a firearm for you to get an ERPO. You might wanna prevent them from acquiring one in the near future. So that's a way for you to escalate the, the investigation as well as the criminal response to individuals already in custody. Additionally, there is a usage in the scope of the domestic violence world. Okay, one thing that we always lead with is it's always better to remove the gun and the uh, abuser. Okay, you don't want to leave one without the other. The violence will continue. We know that within the 90 days following access of the criminal justice system, there's an increased risk of harm to that individual, whether there's a firearm in that home or not. So if you can get a protective order that removes him from the home and prevents him from possessing a firearm, that is always best. In the event you do not get that order. Perhaps you've attempted, it's been denied, okay? Perhaps you've attempted and it's been limited and he's been allowed to stay in the home, which was my case in a number of instances back in Queens. You might then wanna go get an ERPO because you know there's a firearm and it's a limited order and he's allowed to stay in that house with her. Using an ERPO in tandem would remove that firearm and hopefully safeguard her life. So that's another use. Um, in other conversations, we've heard of individuals getting ERPOs in response to bomb threats, perhaps. Um, other threats of violence that may not include a firearm, but intended to harm others or themselves, and they've utilized ERPO in those same instances. So going back to what we said before about utilizing it as a part of a multi-pronged strategy, similarly for prosecutors, look at this as another tool in your toolbox when you're responding to violent offenders. We'll just go to implementation tips, because um, I think this is really what, what you guys can walk away with. We have a handful here. Hopefully, we can get a, a question or two. Um, just running through what we've already talked about. Before you even start implementation, engage with your community. Talk to your unique stakeholders. Make sure you identify your local, unique needs and resources. Make sure you're engaging with the people who are more likely to respond to these uh, petitions, engage with your local veterans associations, perhaps your department of the VA. They have a unique ability to identify folks who pose a risk to themselves as well. As many of you know, we have a veteran suicide crisis happening in this country right now. Finding those means and mechanisms by which you can identify those folks before they harm themselves is important. 
continually engaging with your community after implementation is a necessary part as well, either for the unique expertise of those medical professionals, or rather the school administrators here in New York, or even the family members who know what's happening day to day with the respondent and can inform you, one, the information you need to have a successful petition, but two, to make sure you're also wrapping that respondent in social services if you have such available to prevent them from escalating the violence or the risk to themselves or others. Yeah, and I think, you know, primarily we know that we have leadership in the room and folks who are really going to be focusing on what everyone else needs to know. We really encourage you to have a comprehensive training and resourcing process. Um, if nothing else, it is that every officer on the street understands what an ERPO is, when they can use it, and how they can educate others about it as well. And of course, the coordination piece is key. Make sure you have the right stakeholders, everyone who is a part of your criminal justice ecosystem who might have any sort of input, either on your offenders or the process, the paperwork, the return or receipt of firearms. Have everyone at the table so you can define that strategy ahead of time so it can be effective. Um, additionally, as we mentioned, part of the multi-pronged strategy, comprehensive training, after hours response protocol, um, and then collaborate, collaborate with those unique petitioners. It's not enough to just talk to them at the outset. It's not enough to just ask them, hey, what should we be doing? How, what's the problematic behavior we should be looking out for? But continually collaborating with them to develop your policy and procedures will make sure they're trauma-informed, right? You want to be centered around victims. So that when you're responding, you can decrease the risk to both yourselves as well as the respondent and the family members who may be in the home. Any questions? So there is a number of issues with that, obviously. Um, there's the personal property right of the dad. Um, in a number of instances, courts have had the father appear before the court to show proof that he safeguarded it and prevented the respondent from acquiring that firearm. So there is a number of ways that different jurisdictions might fashion that sort of solution, whether that is to remove the firearms, have that individual appear at the court, and then make that sort of uh, articulation before having them return to a lockbox off-premises, or whether it's to leave them and work with your courts in advance to come up with some other process. But that is a hairy situation, and most likely you will need that, that father or mother, who's uh, the possessor, to put them in a safeguarded location outside of the home. But you need not necessarily take it away from that person. You just have to require that the respondent not be able to access it. Correct. That's correct. Going back there. And in addition to that, on November 13th, both of us will be in California, San Diego PD. Um, they've actually received funding from their version of GIVE called CalVIP to do statewide training. So we're going to go out there. We're going to get all their paperwork. We're going to find out everything they're doing, and we're going to spread it around. So let's stay in touch.
Yeah, well, to answer a couple of those questions, and obviously we're about a month and a half in, so those hearings are still taking shape, right? Um, one, respondents don't get attorneys, nor do families. So if they want to petition, they have to represent themselves. To your front of the court comment, that's the same capacity in which the Seattle City Attorney's Office began presenting at the court. So providing that criminal history information at those decision points, ex parte as well as final order, they were similarly appearing because they have access to that information. Regarding the note regarding citizens, they also um, have developed a victim assistance program in tandem with their ERPO implementation. So they actually have an individual who safety plans with family members when they come in. Um, I think in the last year, they've safety planned for more than 100 individuals. Um, and safety planning is tailored to each individual, hopefully to remove that person from that individual. But we know that in domestic violence, it's hard to do. But wrapping them in services so that perhaps we can uh, reduce the, the likeliness of harm. Well, I know in Seattle, their local DV organization was actually a part of their task force going into the courts. They were a part of the development of their policies and their procedures. They were considered uh, local stakeholders that needed to have input in the process. And I would recommend that whether it be domestic violence or veteran associations, you identify those nuanced communities within your county that you want to engage with so you can afford them the access to this tool. But yes. We need the witnesses. Was the respondent present? Yes. But they weren't able to complete the hearing, maybe due to a need for additional witnesses or hearing? If they need to, if they need to provide a witness or additional evidence, yes, I do. I believe that is the way it happens here in New York State. Um, so yes, I, I do believe it's statutory. I don't know if that's for me or for you. Yeah. No, it's only for the pendency of the actual ERPO. So at the ex parte phase, it's a short term uh, order and the final order is up to a year. Yes, and that would be forever. Last question, I think we're at time.
my interpretation of the law is that you will not face any liability for not utilizing this tool. It's not prescribed that you have to, in specific instances, get an ERPO, but rather, if you are to get an ERPO, this is how you have to go about getting it. Thank you.